بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم دوش از سر عاشقی و از مشتاقی می کردم التماس می از ساقی چون جاه و جمال خیش بنمود به من من نیست شدم به ماند ساقی ساقی Hello everybody My name is Rasul and in this video I will be talking about Ibn Arabi's Seals of Wisdom that is Fusus al-Hikam The poem I just recited was from Rumi in the original language Farsi. So a rough translation of it would be something like Last night, out of love and desire, I was begging the cupbearer for wine. When he showed me his grandness and beauty, I disappeared. There remained only the cupbearer and the cupbearer. In Persian mystical literature, cupbearer means God. And wine means divine knowledge or divine love. Uh, the focus of this discussion, like I said, will be this tremendous book, um, a dense book to understand, Fusus al Hikam, uh, written by Ibn Arabi. Uh, the hope is that I could shed light on this dense book. Um, I, I, I will categorize my aims and I will inform you on what sources I have used. Um, my central focus in this video is uh, the unity of the soul with the one in, most, in more Greek terms. Um, but generally there is this doctrine in the Islamic metaphysics that has been named by scholars other than Ibn Arabi, the doctrine of unity of existence or Wahdat al-Wujud. Um, Ibn Arabi himself does not use this terminology, but uh, based on what is written in his books, it is clear when you read it, when you read the commentaries, when you understand the book. Um, the doctrine that is echoed in this book is, I think, rightly named the doctrine of unity of existence. Now, for those of you who do not know Ibn Arabi, his full name is Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Muhammad ibn Arabi Hatim Yatai, shortened as Ibn Arabi. Um, he was an Arab Islamic philosopher, mystic poet, and Sufi scholar. He was born in Mercia in Andalusia, Spain, in the year 560 AH, that is 1165 AD, and he passed away in Damascus, Syria, in the year 638 AH, or 1240 AD. Uh, because of the significance of his work in Islamic metaphysics, um, philosophy, theology, kalam, uh, generally he is referred to as the great master or as Sheikh al Akbar and animator of religion, that is, Muhyiad Din. Um, he has written not like numerous works, uh, he, he was very proliferous. But uh, two of his most famous works are Al Fatuhat al Makkiya, that is the Meccan revelations or the Meccan unveilings, which is my preferred terminology in the translation, and uh, the Seals of Wisdom or Al Fusus al Hakam. They also translate it as the Ring Stones of Wisdom. Um, I prefer Seals. Ring Stones is more accurate. Uh, considering yeah. the etymology of this uh, of this name. We should break the word into two. We have Fasus and we have Hikam. Fasus is the plural form of Fas in Arabic, that is Ringstone. And Hikam is the plural form of Hikmah. Uh, some basically translate it as wisdom or philosophy. But I should make a clarification here. Uh, Hikmah in Arabic is not necessarily philosophy in English. Hikmah is a generic term, it's an umbrella term. It includes philosophy, yes, but philosophy is not uh, all that it is in this term. It includes philosophy, divine knowledge, theology, revelatory knowledge, traditional knowledge, that is Quran and Hadith, and um, a mystical knowledge. These whole, this whole package is called Hikmah in, in Arabic. So its plural form is Hikam. So when, when we put these two terms together, we have Fusus al hikam that is seals or ring stones of uh, wisdoms, 
literally, but most people translate it as wisdom when it comes to the name of the book. I, I have gone with that, but literally it means ring stones are wisdoms. And by this, uh, Ibn Arabi means that every prophet is a seal that God uses to safeguard the treasure chests of existence. So that's the etymology of this word. Uh, this book has 27 chapters. In each chapter, Ibn Arabi is discussing the, the, the wisdom particular to each prophet. He starts with Prophet Adam. He describes his wisdom. And then he goes one by one, 27 prophets only, and uh, describing their unique wisdom and their uh, like divine knowledge. Um, this is a very dense book, a short one, but extremely dense. We will learn more about this book. What I'm going to share in this video is the result of my thesis. This was a master thesis. Um, a chapter of my thesis was related to Ibn Arabi's Doctrine of the Unity of Existence in Fusus al-Hikam. Another chapter was related to uh, the theory of emanation in the Plotinian uh, cosmology, and Plotinus being the Egyptian new platonic uh, figure in the philosophy world. But that's another video. I will prepare another video specifically for Plotinus. Here I'm just, just talking about Ibn Arabi, just that chapter. Um, so my aim here is shedding light on the metaphysical position of the doctrine of unity of existence, that is Rahdat al-Wujud. In Ibn Arabi's Fusus al-Hikam, the seals of wisdom, in particular, I focus on unity of the soul with God. The central interpretive question I will be examining is this. How does Ibn Arabi's seals of wisdom understand the doctrine of the unity of existence? So we are going to go through a journey together. And uh, our focus is, let us see what the Wahdat al-Wujud or doctrine of unity of existence is from Ibn Arabi's point of view. Whether this doctrine is right or not is another issue. But in order for us to understand whether this doctrine is credible, or as some may have called it worse than unbelief first you have to understand it i think one of the biggest problems uh, that arise that arises in such sensitive matters is that people get a very superficial knowledge on what they want to examine and then they immediately react to that but it is highly important to first understand what it is that a thinker is trying to say, even if you do not agree with him or her, just first first understand what he's saying, then try to judge it. And um, that should be a bold-faced, capitalized rule in every academic environment. So judgment aside, put away your judgments. Let us not care whether this um, doctrine is right or not in the first step. In the first step, we should understand this doctrine. Then. If you have reasons, credible reasons, philosophically, theologically, fine, let's bring them on paper and publish it. Uh, but that's step number two. Um, for now, let us, let us see what this doctrine is. I will examine this whole book in general, uh, but my central focus is chapter one, um, uh, the chapter in which Ibn Arabi talks about the divine wisdom of Prophet Adam. And um, this is basically the chapter he puts the foundation, he sets the foundation of this doctrine, the doctrine of Ahdat al-Wujud. Again, I'm emphasizing Ibn Arabi himself does not use this terminology. The books that, they, there are lots of commentaries written for this book, but uh, I will be focusing on two. One is Muwahid, which is a very, very great source. Uh, for those who speak Farsi, I totally recommend reading this commentary. Um, and another one is Hassan Zadi Amuli's commentary. Um, I will not go through the details of the other sources. So having said what I wanted to say, let's delve into it. In chapter 1 of Fusus al-Hikam, Ibn Arabi says this, this is a direct quote, my own translation. The real wish to see the essences of his names, which are infinite in number. Or you could say he wished to see his essence in an all-comprehensive being, which being qualified with existence encompassed the order of all the divine names so that 
in it, he manifested his mystery to himself. Uh, let us see what this dense paragraph means. Um, it can be understood from this paragraph that the real contemplated himself in his essence and um, contemplating yourself in, 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 in an essential manner is one thing and contemplating yourself on another being is another matter. Not that there is another being. We will talk about that. That was just a preview. He wanted an object to contemplate the essence of his names and qualities on. So it can be understood that every part of the world is a locus that reflects the divine names. Because of her all comprehensive nature, human being is the best reflecting part of this mirror, let's say. Thus, in the above quote, where Ibn Arabi says, in an all comprehensive being, God wanted to manifest himself, his names actually, and his qualities or attributes, depending on how you translate it. Uh, they, 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 they quantify all, all comprehensive, refers not to all parts of the world, but to human beings. So based on this framework, we could summarize this section like this. Um, the divine essence wanted to contemplate himself in an, on an object, but so for this purpose, he manifested himself right unto the world. It came in several stages, we will discuss that. But he made that manifestation, he manifested himself, he emanated himself, as some would call it. So the world is like an image, a picture that comes from that projector. But it is important to realize that this picture is not essential manifestation. Um, no being, and I'm emphasizing, no being has the capacity to receive absolute essential manifestation. Tajalli al mutlaq. Yeah, it's not possible. So God wanted to see the essences of his names and his qualities, as Ibn Arabi says here, on that object. It's like he wanted a mirror on which to to see his to see the essences of his names, to see the manifestation of his names, his qualities. What this means is um, we're going to discuss shortly. For now, I cannot give out everything. So this picture will make more sense in the following slides. Now, in Ibn Arabi's um, cosmology, there is a very important term that uh, one needs to be familiar with, and that's al-ayan al-thabita, or the fixed entities, as they translate it. They also translate it as immutable archetypes, or essences, or universals, but they're misleading because there seems to be a difference between universals, per se, and al-ayan al-thabita uh, in general. Even if they can, they, they are sometimes used interchangeably as synonyms, there seems to be a difference. And personally, from what I have read in this book, it appears that when Ibn Arabi is talking about universal properties as generosity, as knowledge, as humanity, he uses the, he uses the term um, al-umurat al-kulliyya, that is, uh, universal realities. It is also translated as universals. Uh, so basically, we all share in, we all participate in that, in those uh, universal properties, in those universal realities. But when he's talking about the whatness, the quiddity of the existence in the divine knowledge, which I will explain, he doesn't use the term murat al kulliya. He uses the term al ayana thabita, that is the fixed entities. What are those? Before I explain the two terms, let us first understand what I mean by the divine knowledge. Um, consider this. In the Islamic metaphysics and Islamic theology, actually, um, it is believed that the human being does not have the capacity to understand uh, the divine essence. God says, I am beyond your comprehension. I haven't given you the faculties to be able to understand that essence. And... Uh, what you understand is only God's names and qualities, their reflections and whatever comes from them. So, how does it mean? Let us talk about creation first. Um, some are opposing creation, saying that, oh, what was God doing before creation? Was there a before the term, before, before creation? And oh, did he know these things or he, did he just come up with it and created it? And there were lots of confusions in this regard. But Ibn Arabi's um, 
mentality, his frame of work settles many, many problematic things in the philosophical, theological, and mystical discussions. He says, uh, before God created the world, um, he had the whatness, the quiddity of all existence that are in this world right now, or could be an existent entity in this world, in his world of knowledge, in his mind, if you will. Um, by mind, we should be careful. We are we are not using the term mind as we use it for humans. It's just a figure of speech to transfer the information. Um, the world of God's knowledge is the best translation here. Some translate it as reality of realities, but I think it is inaccurate because reality of realities or haqiqat al-haqaiq is a, a term that Ibn Arabi uses and which we will discuss. But, uh, there is an overlap with the term haqiqat al-haqaiq, reality of realities, and the world of God's knowledge, but that's not all to uh, reality of realities. It is more than that. We will discuss that. But for now, there is a world of God's knowledge. Before creation, every existent, everything had this had had its thingness, had its quiddity in that mind, in that world. So the the, the, the thingness of this book, the thingness of this uh, desk of me as a human being was up there. So this thingness or this quiddity is what Ibn Arabi calls al ayana thabita, um, the fixed entities. Ayn in Arabic means essence in some translations. It also means entity. Um, if, if you translate it as essence, or sometimes people translate it as archetype, uh, it could be misleading. Uh, I think the best translation here is the word entity. So ayn, entity, it's plural form, ayan, entities. And uh, the second part of the term is uh, thabit or thabita, um, which is a word in Arabic meaning fixed, immutable, unvarying. So when you put them together, there comes al ayana thabita, there comes uh, fixed entities. I think this is the most accurate translation. Some translate it as immutable archetypes, unvarying essences, but they, they could be misleading. So here is um, the thingness of things in this world the quiddity of existent entities in the world of God's knowledge. These all are existent entities, and by existent uh, we mean uh, existent in the world of senses, like uh, things that you can uh, experience your, through your sensation, through the five senses. I can see this book, I can touch this desk. Uh, so these are all sensible things. Uh, but the thingness of these all come from the world of God's knowledge. Um, there was this quiddity in the world of God's knowledge. God poured existence into it, and there came out this book. Um, there was the thingness or quiddity of the book. God poured existence into it. And I repeated it twice for you to understand it clearly. So that is the term al-ayana thabita, or uh, the fixed entities. Uh, but there is also a more generic term, al-umurat al kulliya which, like I said, uh, could be translated as universal realities. And it refers to what philosophers call um, universal properties. There is the pr property of humanity, not humanity as an individual, but the humanity itself. It's a property, it's not an individual thing. Um, we all are humans, the ones that are watching this video, I'm hoping. And uh, we are different people in some respects, and we are the same in some others. Um, so there is a particularity for me and for you. There, is, there are things that separate my personality from yours. But despite all these differences, our humanity does not change. Humanity is one. Ibn Arabi gives the, knowledge, gives the example of knowledge, ilm, in the first chapter of Sus al-Hikam. He says, um, God knows, angels know, Human, being, human beings now, um, despite this apparent plurality, um, the reality of knowledge is the same. Knowledge is one and the same thing. And um, it is the same with regard to things that are present in time and things in relation to the things that are beyond time. Human beings know we have knowledge, 
But um, because we are temporal beings, we are prisoned in time. Uh, we say we, we know uh, temporally uh, God's, God is beyond temporality. God is beyond time. So his knowledge is eternal. But still, knowledge is the same. The same knowledge. What I mean is knowledge does not break into the parts when it's divided among individuals. It's not like some part of knowledge will be taken off and will give, be given to you and some parts will be given to me. No matter how many recipients there are, this property, knowledge, is one. So that's what Ibn Arabi calls um, universal realities or he sometimes refers to them as realities as well. So it is important to know the distinction. This is my reading of Ibn Arabi's Sus al um, Some, like Muvahid, use the term immutable archetypes and al ayan al um interchangeably, but I, I see a difference when I read the translations. So let me explain a bit more about the immutable archetypes, or al ayan al thabita Ibn Arabi, according to Ibn Arabi's cosmology, uh, dwelling intelligibly in God's knowledge, um, in one respect, the immutable archetypes are the intelligible forms of the divine names and qualities. And in another, they are the thingness or the quiddity of the existent entities, that is, the corporeal entities, the things that we see in this material world. So this first part is really interesting um, because before Ibn Arabi, um, Greek thinkers were also discussing similar things. For example, Plotinus, which we will discuss in the next video. But um, they, they, they also discussed archetypes, essences, God's thought, the intellect, the intelligence, as they put it. But he does not introduce God's names and qualities as having a role, playing a role in this cosmology. Uh, he says, um, by he I mean Plotinus, he says um, the intellects, the individual intellects within the intellect, capital, are intelligible entities. And they are, let's say, the things through which the one, in his terminology, manifests things on, on, onto, onto the world. So these intelligible entities are essences. Ibn Arabi, uh, to some extent, acknowledges that, but he takes a further step. He says, all right, but these intelligible entities, if you'd like to call it, as philosophers do, um, are the essences of his names and his qualities. So basically, we said the immutable archetypes are um, the things uh, through which God pours existence and creates the world. But because Ibn Arabi says they are the essences of God's names and qualities, Putting these two together, it's very understandable that um, God's, God creates the world through his names, through his qualities. Uh, so these names and qualities are kind of, to put it in more street language, are his workers, uh, the workers that bring existence from the world of God's knowledge into the existent world. How? We will talk about that. All right, what else do we know about uh, the immutable archetypes? We know that immutable archetypes are, as Ibn Arabi puts it, uh, both hidden and manifest. They are hidden in the sense that they do not have ex external existence, that is, sensual existence as such. Um, they are the thingness, the quiddity, that always stay in the world of God's knowledge. They don't walk out. What happens is God gives them existence the manifestation of them in the sensible world appears, not the immutable archetypes themselves. So in that sense, they are hidden. But they are also manifest in the sense that what we see here is the manifestation of those hidden entities. As an example, uh, think about a painter. Uh, before she designs something, she has a design in her head, in her mind, and she brings that design onto the paper, onto the work, onto the canvas. So basically, the design is both hidden and manifest. It is hidden in the sense that it does not walk out. It's an entity up here. And it is also manifest in that uh, it is exactly that design that appears in the material form. So it is important for you to understand this. This is how Ibn Arabi says immutable archetypes are both manifest and hidden. Then he gives uh, two very interesting uh, examples. 
he gives the example of colorless light first. What he says is this, the real is like a colorless light that passes through the colorful glasses which are placed between the real and the observer. Imagine this. Uh, we are just considering points. We cannot localize God. We are just we want to talk, and when we talk, we are present with a human language. So we have to go through these limitations. Let's say there is the real God, considered point A, and there is an observer. Let's say me, in point, let's say C. Um, there is in between them a point B which as we discussed are the immutable archetypes. So what happens is from this point A to point B, a light is manifested. So uh, when the light is coming this way, in point B, there are colorful glasses. So when that colorless light passes through these colorful glasses and these colorless glasses being fixed entities, the colorless light takes up the color of these Glasses. So what we see in point C in the observer's place is just colorful things, colorful, colorful lights coming to us. But um, are they really colored? No, says Ibn Arabi in one sense, because essentially that, that those lights are colorless. They just take up the color of their immutable essences. And in one sense, yes, they are colored. The difference is how you perceive them, how you conceive them. Um, when you consider them from a physical sensation point of view, you're right. The color that you see is blue or green or whatever the color. But when you think about it from a logical standpoint, you know that those colors are relative. They do not exist as such. The existence is that light, um, the colorless light. Um, and in Arabic, that is a divine name, an nur that is the light capital. So this, this example makes it very clear what Ibn Arabi is trying to say. So the colorless light comes, passes through colorful glasses, comes out as colorful lights, and you observe them as colorful in this world. You see this book, you see this desk, that computer, you see me, a face which you have to tolerate till the end of this video. But those are the manifestations, um, the externalized, the expressions of the immutable entities, the fixed entities. In a second example, he exemplifies the world as a, sh as a shadow. He says, the relation of the cosmos to the real is like that of the shadow to an individual. Um, there's an individual, she has a shadow, that individual, let's exemplify it, let's compare it to God and that shadow being the world. The shadow itself does not exist. For it to exist, exist, and it depends on a source and that source is that individual in that case. And applying to the world, the world itself does not exist. It, it existentially depends on another being, a superior being. So the superior being is a necessary being or God, the reality, and uh, the world is a contingent being, that is, a being, an existence, that draws its existence or its being from another source. It is dependent on another being, but the source itself is wajib al wujud. Um, it exists necessarily, necessary existence, necessary being. It does not depend on another being for its existence or being. All right. Next is my favorite paragraph in this chapter. Um, Ibn Arabi says, and I'm quoting, The real had initially created the entire world as something amorphous and without a soul, like an unpolished mirror. And the divine decree requires that when he prepares a place, that place receives the divine spirit. This reception has been interpreted as blowing the divine spirit into, into it, that is, into the amorphous thing. And this blowing the divine spirit is none other than the fact that the amorphous form receives the aptitude to accept the eternally manifesting emanation, which has always existed and will always exist. Well, that is confusing. 
this is a very dense paragraph and there are lots of things here to decipher. First, let me ask you, what does Ibn Arabi mean by a mirror not yet polished? What he means by the divine breath breathed into the amorphous thing? And what in the world is that amorphous thing? Uh, we're going to have to answer them one by one to be, un to be able to understand what he's saying in this paragraph. The term amorphous literally means formless. So, uh, in the line immediately following this quote that I just read to you, Ibn Arabi refers to this amorphous thing as receptacle. Receptacle. And by receptacle, literally meaning receiver, and comparing it to an unpolished mirror, Tris seems to mean that at this stage, God has not yet imposed form on the shapeless thing by having it receive definite universals. To understand what he's saying here, you, you need to understand what he means by the divine breath breathed into the formless thing. In the Quran, in chapter 15, verse 29, it says, a verse in which concerning God's creating Adam, God says, I have proportioned him and breathed into him of my spirit. So when Ibn Arabi says this has been interpreted as uh, the divine breath, breathe, this is what he means, like he's uh, alluding to Quran. So the general picture here is this, this is my take. Uh, God first created Adam's body and then breathed his spirit into him. First he gave him the amorphous matter, then he gives them the universals proper to human nature imposed on it. Um, first, the shapeless matter, then the universals. This is the general picture. So this was more philosophical, more literal explanation. But put it more figuratively, what Ibn Arabi is saying is like this. Uh, God wanted to see himself on a mirror. And he created the world as a mirror on which to con contemplate his names and qualities. At first, this mirror was not completed. It, 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 needed, it needed a light, it needed a spirit, a soul, to, to, to make this corpus, this dead corpus alive, to give, it, to give it life, to gloss it, to enlighten it. And for this purpose, God breathed his spirit into the human being. Not the whole world. The Quran is very specific on this and the human being. This soul, this divine soul, comes to human being and human being alone. We will talk about that. This is just a glance. So basically, human being is what completes the creation. It was a corpse, it was a dead matter, a lifeless matter, and that divine breath flowed into it as the spirit and enlightened it, glossed it, made it perfect. So the world becomes perfect with the human beings. Now, at the end of that, uh, that paragraph, there was this confusing sentence. It says, God made the amorphous form receive the aptitude to accept the eternally manifesting emanation, which has always existed and will always exist. What does this mean? And here I'm translating as emanation. Most people translate it as a manifestation, a tajalli in Arabic. Uh, emanation is a more technical term in philosophy. That's why I have used it here. What, what is the nature, nature of this manifestation or this emanation? Well, you have to read commentaries to understand uh, what this emanation or what this manifestation is, to, to understand its nature. But Muvahid, as I told you, puts it this way. He says the divine emanation is two-folded. Um, actually, Ibn Arabi himself uses two terminologies. This is a, like a commentary on those terminologies. He does not explain it like word for word, but this is what he has in mind. There is a manifestation, there is an emanation from God reflected onto the world. But this manifestation comes in two stages. Not that these stages are separate, uh, we, we, we are speaking um, within human languages. So here is what happened. First, God conceived those immutable entities, those fixed entities in his mind. Mind, again, I'm using carefully. That is, in the world of God's knowledge. So there was this self-disclosure, this self-manifestation through which he conceived these entities, these quiddities of the things in the world. 
or the things that will come to, into the world or things that could come into the world like all possibilities so that's what Ibn Arabi calls al, al fayz al aqdas or it's translated as the most holy emanation the most holy manifestation or the holiest manifestation now from there let's say the light came that by light i'm speaking figuratively here the light came and through those quiddities uh, the colorful lights appeared in, on, onto the world so we, we see this book we see this desk we see these books so this is the second aspect of that uh, manifestation um, the second aspect of the manifestation is what reflects the immutable entities onto the world and Ibn Arabi calls that al fayz al muqaddas or some translate it as barely um, the holy emanation instead of the most holy emanation or you could use sacred emanation sacred manifestation so just to summarize first um, the holiest emanation is the principle manifestation metacosmic where the immutable essences are divinely conceived before their apparent projection in the relative existence this is exact quote from Bukhart and two the sacred emanation is the manifestation that projects the fixed entities onto the existent sensible world so put them together that's how the world was created first self-disclosure of God to himself in the world of his knowledge and from there his manifestation up uh, onto the uh, corporeal world next in chapter one of the seals of wisdom in arabi talks about the human nature actually he discusses this in two parts of, of, of this chapter and other parts as well like there are two general pictures that comes to mind in, in in first part he talks about the human being as a tripartite being that means a being that has three aspects three parts and then later he um, categorizes those three into two two groups we will talk about that so the three partite picture is this in first chapter of the social hikam he says the human constitution has divine all comprehensiveness and this is um, like reserved only for human being not other in, not other creatures only for human from one aspect he goes back to the divine from one to the reality of realities we will discuss that in detail but for now just consider it the world of god's knowledge that's not all that there is to it but for now only consider that and from another this is the third aspect that which is required by the universal nature but encompasses all the receptacles of the world top to bottom so three aspect the divine aspect through the divine breath the immutable entity or the fixed entity aspect being in the world of god's knowledge and then the, the more natural aspect the bodily aspect so this constitution this all comprehensive constitution is what ibn arabi calls al insan al kamil or the perfect man uh, as they translate it uh, animals for example do not have this divine spirit god breathed his spirit only into the human being which means in his terms the perfect man this, this complex three-partite com constitution but then he groups it into two he says um, the human beings are dual they have two aspects to support this he alludes to quran he says in chapter 38 verse 75 he says um, god said i have created adam with my two hands hands and he interprets it this way he say by hands god means the two different aspects of the human being or two aspects through which god created human beings so which is why he's discussing it as the two hands he is number one his exterior form that is human beings exterior form being of realities and of the forms of the world that is the the, the fixed entities and the um, the forms the physical forms that we see in this world and number two his interior aspect being of the divine form that is the the, the divine breath that a human being alone carries in this world so in this sense human beings are dual in the, basically the, the previous sense they are 
a tripartite. They are the same. We are just discussing relational things. Um, then he says, and it is because of this that God said of human being, I become his hearing and I become his sight. He did not say I become his ear or his eye. He distinguished between the forms. What does this mean? Um, the, there, is a, there is a hadith, a saying from the Prophet of Islam. Um, in the night of ascent or mi'raj in Arabic, uh, the Prophet of Islam is said to, 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 to have talked to God. He asked questions, for example. And one of the questions is that, tell me, the Prophet says, tell me um, about the human beings that you like. Uh, it, it's a long hadith, actually. I'm going to shorten it. This is like, if I like them, I would do this. I would expect this. But there is this interesting part. It says, when I like a human being, I become his sight. I become his hearing. And Ibn Arabi uses that. He says, God didn't say, I become, I become his eye. I become his ear. He distinguished between the forms. He said his sight and his hearing. So the dual aspect, exterior, internal. Next, to make clear the human relationship with the real, he gives two more examples. In the first one, he says the human being is the king's seal. What this means is this. In the past, kings used rings to safeguard their treasure chests. So the, the rings basically had marks in, markings on them. They were like the ring part, uh, like the, the, the silver part, gold part, whatever. And there was this stone part. And on this stone part, there were uh, markings and uh, kings used those markings to seal their treasure chests. So for Ibn Arabi, human being is, is that part. Human being is that marked seal that God uses to safeguard the treasure chest of existence. Which is why, says Ibn Arabi, the Quran in chapter 2, verse 30, um, calls the human being God's vicegerent on the earth. So he's the seal, he's the ring, or she's the seal, she is the ring that God uses to safeguard his treasure chests. In the next example, Ibn Arabi says, the relationship between man and God is like that of the pupil and the eye. Um, so basically, the human being is the pupil through which the all-seeing contemplates his creation. A very beautiful simile, a very beautiful example. And the interesting thing is, in Arabic, the term for pupil literally means man inside eye. Also in Farsi, we have mardumak. Mardum means people, but it, um, it's a generic term. It also means human being. So, and that word ak that is added to that. It means little. So, little human. Also, we have it in, 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 in Farsi. And as far as I know, it is also the case with Turkish language. They also have this translation, the, 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 this terminology for, for the pupil. So, just to repeat, the human being is the pupil through which God contemplates the world. Next comes a very controversial passage, um, and this is as it goes. This, lo this caused lots of problems for those who did not understand, who do not understand what he is saying here. He says, the human being is at once created in time and eternal, and the being created and ever-living, or immortal, now, there are lots of criticisms here. The, some critics say this. This is the critics speaking, not me. They say this remark is not only self-contradictory, but it also entails the eternity of the world. However, because only God is eternal and the world, including human being, is created in time, this thesis is flawed. Well, this is their take. Um, there has been lots of attempts, lots of answers, full answers. Uh, to this criticism. Here I'm just considering two of them. One is from Qaysari and the other one is from Makki. So let me just read them to you. Qaysari says, eternity of the human being is true of his soul, not of, not of his corporeal bodily existence. Although we say that both the human being and God are eternal and immortal, there is a distinction between them. The human being's soul's eternity, and here is very. This is very important. 
the human soul's eternity is essentially, that means considering its essence, preceded by non-existence. In that, its existence essentially depends on God. I'm going to repeat that one more time at the end. But it is not the case with God. Let me repeat that. The human being's soul, the human soul's eternity is essentially preceded by non-existence. In that, its existence is essentially dependent on God. But it is not the case with God. He does not depend on another being for his existence. He is the reason for his being. That's what we call wajib al wujud in Arabic. Um, so here it seems that Qaisari is saying that essentially um, there was no human soul before creation. God breathed his soul, God, divine soul, into Adam and God created the human soul. So this is how we say that his soul was preceded by non-existence. He came into the being, yes, as human form, as a human soul, sorry. But still, the spirit that comes, that comes from God, is eternal. So this is what Ibn Arabi uh, has in mind, uh, according to Qaisari. He says this is a human being's soul that is eternal, not his body. Mackey has a different take. He says, the human being's corporeal existence is created in time, yes, but his existence in the world of God's knowledge is eternal. It's not his soul. It's his existence in the world of God's knowledge that is eternal. So to him, a being created perpetual and immortal points to the human being, his life in the afterworld. Um, but which one of these seem more accurate? Uh, Mubahis says, and I wholeheartedly agree with him, that Qaisari's uh, case is uh, better because if according to Mackey we say, okay, human beings' um, existence in the world of God is uh, what Ibn Arabi means by his etern eternal part, um, if so, then how, how, is different, how is human being different from any other existent beings? All these entities Quiddity existed in the world of God's knowledge. How, how are we different from the others? So Qaisari's take is better. Human soul is eternal. His physical aspect is created in time. That's the picture. Next, Ibn Arabi discusses a very interesting part. He says, here he's discussing the contingent and the essentially necessary. Um, he says, the created in time has an essential dependence on a source. And this dependence necessitates that the former reflects the latter's form. Uh, so, um, let me repeat that. The created in time has an essential dependence on its source. We are created in time. The whole world is created in time. So for it to exist, it depends on another being. And because it depends on another being, it carries its form. Like this, this, this being, the reality, Al-Haqq, God, Sorry, the real Al-Haq God uh, gives me, you, and world existence. And through that manifestation, we carry his form. So the world is created in time, and as a contingent being, it depends on God for its existence. Therefore, having an essential dependence on him, the world reflects God's form. And I'm repeating, the world reflects God's form. Am I saying that whatever you see is God? No, that if somebody says that, it would be, yes, worse than unbelief. Some critics uh, criticize Ibn Arabi for that, but that's not what, what he's saying. We will discuss that. This is the doctrine of pantheism, that the world is literally God. What you see, this, this is God. Is, with, with the word is. That's not what Ibn Arabi is saying. Ibn Arabi is saying the world is God's names, manifestations. We, he does not equate the universe with the real, that is not what he is doing. And this is, there is a big, big, big misunderstanding on the parts of the critics here. They are confusing the doctrine of pantheism with the doctrine of unity of existence that Ibn Arabi seems to be advocating. So we will discuss that more in detail. I just want to clear your mind. The universe is not God. The world, the universe is his 
manifestation, the manifestation of his names as qualities. There is no equality. Ibn Arabi does not equate God with the universe. Let me repeat the last part because we're going to need that. The world reflects God's form. Therefore, it says Ibn Arabi, to know God, one needs to contemplate the world where he has put his science. And this part is really interesting where he says um, where God has put his science. This is he's alluding to Quran. For example, in two verses, in, for example, chapter 41, verse 53, God says, we shall show them, that is the human beings, our signs upon the horizon and within themselves. So he's discussing his signs in the universe. And in chapter 20, verse 21, he says, God says, um, upon the earth are signs and within your souls. So Ibn Arabi is alluding to that. He says, if you want to uh, contemplate God in this world, you can't go further. You have to know him. So his creation, you look at the world, not that looking and saying, oh, this is God. No, looking at the world, knowing that behind this manifestation is a unique reality. Um, these manifestations are not real. They are relative. They are projection. They derive their existence. They don't have existence, but they derive their existence, that is the corporeal relative existence, from another being. And that being is necessary in itself and essentially actually necessary. So there is only one essentially necessary being, and uh, Ibn Arabi calls that the real God. Um, other than him, all existence are all existence is relative, and all entities do not exist as such. They exist relatively, contingently, as shadows, as reflections, as projections. So this is uh, one of the things that I find, uh, and one of the points that I find Ibn Arabi's critics too shallow, um, that they are accusing him of pantheism. Like clearly, they have not read this part. There might be other parts that are. Uh, difficult for Ibn Arabi to defend himself against, but at least this part, uh, uh no, not at all. Now, just to add another interesting point here, uh, we said before that the human being has all comprehensiveness. So basically, human being has divine form, that is divine spirit. He has uh, the, the reality of reality aspect, and he has the world aspect. The other parts do not have that. They have the reality of reality aspect, and they have the world aspect, but not the divine spirit. A constitution because of which human being is different human being is higher than other beings which in the modern world people do not like to hear but i'm not here to make people happy or an arab is not here to hit to make people happy we are here to discuss what you think is true and yeah i'm gonna stop there other creatures should be protected they should be loved but that love, that protection, that affection doesn't mean that we are equal um, in this picture. But things are clear. I will not dwell on that that much. So based on this unique human constitution, um, the recognition of God, says Ibn Arabi, reaches its apex through human self-recognition. So if you know yourself, that's the highest degree of knowledge that you can get from the divine. Um, because God reflects his names and his qualities most brightly through human beings. And this is in, in line with Islamic tradition as well. For example, the Prophet of Islam has a hadith. He says, one who knows himself knows his Lord. Um, how, how, is any, how is it any different from what Ibn Arabi is saying? Next, he says, when we witness God, we witness ourselves. And when he witnesses us, he witnesses himself. In chapter 2, he adds, the real is the mirror on which one sees oneself, and the individual is the mirror on which the real sees his names. This could be dangerous. These sentences should be clarified. Uh, think of this. When you stand in front of a mirror, you do not see the mirror itself. What you see is your form onto the, uh, onto the mirror. That's what Kevinari says by the real is the mirror on which one sees oneself. And where he says, when we witness God, we witness ourselves, that's again, when we do not see that mirror itself, we, we, we see ourselves onto that mirror. And when God sees us, he witnesses himself. It's not that literally he's seeing himself. We have to be careful here. 
he is seeing the manifestations, the tajalli in Arabic, of his names and qualities. This is what some critics should have in mind. Next, the Quran says in chapter 57, verse 3, That is, he, God, is the first and the last, and the outward and the inward. This is a very important verse for Ibn Arabi and his, um, his metaphysics. Uh, he opens this verse, he breaks it into parts and he investigates each term carefully. For him, the first means his essence is the source of existence. Um, he is the center from which uh, the existence came to be. It is in this sense that uh, God is considered the first. And when we say God is the last, it is understood that Ibn Arabi is saying that God is called the last because everything ascribed to possible entities finally go back to him. And uh, these two descriptions make more sense when you put them together. Otherwise, if you, if you say like God is the first and last, how how can we call something the first and the last? Let's say there are two things or three things, three entities. If we call this the first, that the last means they are not the same. If so, they are contradictory. We can't say this is the first, this is the last. Defenders of Ibn Arabi's doctrine of the unity of existence say, well, this is a clear sign, on, an approval sign on the doctrine of unity of existence. Because how can an entity how can an existence be both the first and the last? Either it is the first or it is the last. In order for us to be able to, in order for us to be able to call it both the first and the last, there should be unity here. And this argument gets stronger in the second part, where God refers to himself as the inward and the outward. Uh, by the inward, Ibn Arabi says, all emanations come from an inward source, and that is the divine essence. And by the outward, it is understood that the multiplicity that we see in the world is the manifestation, is the emanation of the divine names and qualities. So again, the, the defenders of the doctrine of unity uh, assert here that uh, how can an entity be both the outward and the inward and the first and the last if there is no unity? Because, like I said, if you consider it as a multiplicity, like we say, no, I, human being, am not God. Not that Ibn Arabi is saying that I am God. That, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that human beings or other things are manifestations of God. Uh, but if we just stick to that uh, apparent aspect, if we say, okay, I'm not God. So, so what? Are you another being? Are you a separate being? If so, you're, you're in trouble. Like, if that is what you're claiming you are in trouble you are, you are saying there is a god and there is an entity here or other reality here we were separate then you are in trouble you are going to have a very hard time defending yourself um, this is what the uh, defenders of ibn arabi are saying um, they say for in order for you to be able to say that he is the outward now let's say i am the outward one of the outward forms in this world in order for me to be, in order for God to be both this outward part and the inward essence and other aspects of the inward world, there should be a unity, they say. Because if there is no unity between the world and the God, we, we cannot say that he is both the outward and the inward and the first and the last. This is what, what uh, the defenders are saying. And critics um, accuse this text of some very strong <laughs> assertions and claims and charges. But anyways, again, I'm not here to give my opinions. I will not do that. I will neither defend this doctrine nor will I reject it. My job in this video is to explain it, to clarify it. The rest is on you. And I don't wish um, people to come and fight in the comment section. Some of you are against this doctrine and some of you are hardcore into this doctrine. Um, we respect both. I don't want to start any fight. Um, my purpose in creating this video is not to start that war. 
is uh, to, to create a first step to first people understand what this doctrine is and then we take the next steps of the judgment and judgment is not watching this video and saying ha huh, i think that's wrong or ha huh, i think that's right no that's the first step you understand it to some extent that's where you start reading more that's where you start reading commentaries putting it next to the quran putting it next to the hadith and then make a conclusion it took two years for me um, before i clearly made my um, like judgment on whether this doctrine is right or not. I'm not going to say it here because I respect both sides. Um, but all I'm saying is if you want to uh, judge this doctrine's credibility, read, spend lots of time. These are very hardcore, um, strong philosophical, theological, mystical matters. You cannot and you should not actually judge these things by reading one or two, three months and then start judging or i have seen some channels or some pages in uh, in in, uh, in youtube in facebook and on uh, instagram putting posts rejecting rejecting or approving these doctrines or doctrines uh, like this that's not how it works you cannot reject something like this with one or two sentences it it's, it should be a long term thing you have to read and you have to write and personally, I don't believe uh, discussing these matters in that aggressive way is the solution. Um, the only way, I think, to settle uh, the controversy between the defenders and the uh, attackers, let's say, of this doctrine is just and just writing papers and books, that's all. Because this, this will not get anywhere. Um, soon it gets into aggressive verbal and in some cases physical uh, reactions and that's not how it should be i think if you have something to say beautiful bring it on paper write a write, write a paper write a book publish it let the other side answer you and uh, that's my only suggestion for you please no comments and uh, no, no fights in the comments section next there's an objection here um, some critics say how does the multiplicity we see in the world not jeopardize god's oneness that ibn arabi is defending now let me break this uh, objection for you the underlying assumption is this the intended unity is in the sensible corporeal world the intended unity is in the corporeal world which means that okay when we when i look at when i uh, look around i see one book two books three books ten books well there is multiplicity how, how is there any oneness but that's not what mnrb is saying the unity is not considered literally and only in, in in the physical world that that's the underlying assumption one should be very careful about now the critic is considering the corporeal world separate from god which is why she thinks that the multiplicity in this domain negates the unity in existence. That is, there is a God outside this world and there is a physical world. So when there is a, um, a multiplicity here, this multiplicity rejects this one's um, unity, oneness. So there is a separateness. And this itself is problematic. We don't need an Arab to point this out for us. If there is a separation here, it means that there is a reality here and there is a reality here. Who is uh, speaking worse than unbelief here? <laughs> if not Arabi or you? We gotta be careful here. Um, next, multiplicity. Here is my answer. Multiplicity is uh, not my answer, the defender's answer. Multiplicity is a relational matter. No matter how many manifestations appear in the world, essentially, that is, in his essence, God is one, and God is one is taken from uh, in, in this writing um, from um, uh, chapter 111, first verse of the Quran. Allah say that He, that is God, is one. That's what I have taken out in formulating this sentence. Um, so let me repeat that no matter how many manifestations there are essentially god is one 
I'm going to give an example here, but please do not take it in the literal sense. This is just an example. There is, um, there is a projector here. I, um, I, I turn it on. I project something on the wall. You are watching a film. In the film, there, there are lots of things. You know, let's say it's showing New York City with all the buildings, people, cars. There's multiplicity. But is there? Um, no. No matter how many relations, no matter how many manifestations you see on that wall, they, they're not real. They're relational. They, 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 um, there was a unity here between the source and that reflection, that manifestation. There is a oneness here, and that is what Ibn Arabi is pointing out. In essence, God is one. The manifestations are relational. They do not exist as such. So God's oneness should not be considered. This is a very important sentence. Actually, I saw this in Muvahed's book, uh, to which I'm really grateful. It helped me clear my mind um, in, in, about this doctrine, to understand it. He says God's oneness should not be considered oneness despite multiplicity. Hmm? It should not be considered oneness despite multiplicity. Rather, this is oneness encompassing multiplicity. It's not that uh, there is multiplicity in the world and God is here. And despite that multiplicity, uh, there is a God. Yeah, let's say he's one. That, that's not what Ibn Arabi is saying. Um, he's saying this multiplicity, the, the, this one encompasses that multiplicity. There is a unity. It's not that there are a separate stage. It's not a separate part. There is no separation. Ibn Arabi himself actually gives two, example, two examples here that are very helpful to understand the picture. He talks about nature. He says, nature is a platform witnessing, actually this is a paraphrase, not literally his quote. Nature is a platform witnessing births and deaths, increase and decrease, come and go, sameness, changes. But despite all this, and this is important, despite this, despite this come and go, neither a new happening adds something to nature nor the vanishing of something takes something away from it. Despite the diversity of forms, nature is one. And just consider this. Uh, in the world, people die, people are born, animals die, they are born. We invent new things, we throw away new things, we throw away old things. But nature is always one, right? Despite, it's not that there is a multiplicity and despite that there is a oneness. No, the nature encompasses that multiplicity. It, it, it unites it. There is a unity. There is oneness here. He gives another example. He says, he says um, the multiplicity of organs of the body does not defy a person being one. Similarly, uh, the multiplicity of the forms in the world does not deny the oneness of being. I have a heart, I have two, two, two kidneys, I think, not one, two. I have two livers, um, I have a brain, I'm hoping, and I have two hands. But despite all this multiplicity, I, Rasul, is one. I am one. That's the picture here for Ibn Arabi. Next, we come to a very important passage in chapter one. Ibn Arabi says, uh, the real is in every existent in the world to the degree that the reality of that existent requires. Uh, let us open this sentence a little bit. Um, here, by the term reality, he's referring to the fixed entities. Uh, so he's saying that, and we discussed this before, uh, the real God manifests himself in the universe. So every part of the universe is a locus that manifests the real. Some Lokis um, have a weak manifestation and some others have a brighter, stronger manifestation. But what is it um, that determines that a Locus should manifest the real to, to, to a lesser or a, to, a, to a brighter degree? For Ibn Arabi, that is their reality, that is their fixed entity. So according to Ibn Arabi, in, uh, in our fixed entities, we have a Sta'dad, we have um, an aptitude, a capacity per se, and according to these capacities, we receive the divine manifestation and manifest it. So the bigger the aptitude, the, 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 the brighter the manifestation. So let me read the um, sentence uh, again. The real is in every existence in the world 
to the degree that the reality of that existence requires. So from this, it can be understood that uh, the brightest manifestation happens through the human being, because we, as we discussed this before, um, human being and human being alone, because of his divine breath, because of his divine spirit, has the capacity to manifest all names. Um, other beings manifest the real to a lesser degree. Let's say a tree manifests, I'm, I'm just drawing something, only one name to, to, to a lesser degree. But it is only the human that has the capacity, that has the aptitude to manifest the totality of the names all at once if he or she reaches that level. And this has chronic roots as well. For example, um, in, uh, in the Quran, it says, I, God, taught Adam all names, all of them. So by that, some people were taking like, yeah, God uh, taught Adam that the name of a tree, the name of a microphone. No, uh, God taught Adam uh, the reality of those names. He gave Adam the capacity, the aptitude to manifest all those names, to be the locus where God shines most brightly. Um, every existence in the world being the manifestation of God has also Quranic roots as well. For example, in chapter 2, verse 15, we have, uh, To God belongs the East and the West, wheresoever you turn, there is the face of God. So, uh, how, how can someone um, interpret this chronic verse and explain it without resorting to this locus discussion that every part of the universe manifests the real? Um, so they are in line here. Uh, now, there is an objection. Uh, so we discussed this to a degree before. We're going to do it more clearly here. Some say Ibn Arabi's doctrine is pantheism, or at most, panentheism. Uh, but first, let's see what pantheism and panentheism mean. Pantheism is the doctrine that equates the cosmos with God and holds a substantial identity between them. Put simply, according to this doctrine, the universe is God. So what, whatever you see, this wall, this bookcase, this is God. This, this is, is this what Ibn Arabi uh, is saying? No, we will discuss that, but this was the general definition. Panentheism, uh, the second accusation, is the doctrine that holds that although God permeates the cosmos, it is not identical with and limited to it. It extends beyond the cosmos. So what Panentheism is saying is that, yeah, okay, God is not the universe, but it's like the universe contains God, but God extends beyond it. That's what Panentheism is saying. But are any of these accusations fair? No. And uh, there are lots of big, big misunderstandings, especially when it comes to Panentheism. Um, like taking the doctrine of unity of existence as Panentheism is catastrophically wrong. And it stems from a gross misunderstanding. And, uh, the problem that rises when you do not understand, when you do not read something very carefully. Um, according to pantheism, there is a substantial continuity between God and the universe. That is, the cosmos is God. But according to the doctrine of the unity of existence, the cosmos is not God. The cosmos is the manifestation of his names and qualities. Huh? There is no substantial equity, uh, equality between God and the cosmos in the doctrine of the unity of existence. But in pantheism, there is. In pantheism, the universe is God directly. Like whatever you see, you touch is God. This is not what Ibn Arabi is saying. Now, uh, God, according to the doctrine of unity of existence, God, God is transcendent. He has absolute transcendence over every category, even the category of substance. And now, this is a quote from Nasr. Uh, the world and the things in it are not God, but their reality is none other than his. Otherwise, they would be completely independent realities, which is the same as considering them to be deities along with Allah. That, that's not the case. That's not what Ibn Arabi is saying. And unlike pantheism, the doctrine of unity of existence, God existentially, for Ibn Arabi, God existentially differs from the cosmos. 
in, in this doctrine, and which is very clear in Fusus al Hikam, um, God exists necessarily, but the universe exists contingently. That is, the universe derives its existence from another being, but God does not need another being for its existence. So he is wajib al wujud, as we say it in Arabic. Um, he is the necessary existent. Now, the second point, taking the doctrine of the unity of existence or Vahdat al-Wujud as panentheism is also false. Nasr um, says, it is true that God dwells in things. However, in the doctrine of unity of existence, the universe does not contain God, as it is attested in panentheism. So, conclusion, overall, the divine reality encompasses the manifestations without being reduced to them. Next, in chapter 3, Ibn Arabi brings up um, a phenomenal discussion over transcendence and immanence. He says, one who holds only God's transcendence to the world is in error since, in doing so, one accepts God partially and limits him. What this means is, if you say that no, God is absolutely like transcendent with regard to this world, and there is nothing, no manifestation of him in this world, it's like he's beyond this, you're limiting him because you're separating him from this world, saying that there is this world, there is this reality, and there is another reality, God. And how is it different from uh, being a moshrek, as they say in Arabic, one who holds um, the existence of a reality other than God? Then he continues, uh, one who holds only God's imminence in the world is also in error, since in doing so, one restricts him. Saying that the universe is God, like pantheism does, is also incorrect. Like this way we are reducing God to a physical dimension alone. And that is not the case. Uh, so what should we do, Ibn Arabi? He says, uh, one should consider God as both transcendent and immanent in the world. God said there is nothing like him. He, he, this is very interesting. He is taking a Quranic verse. It is chapter 42, verse 11. And he shows it very clearly and very convincingly that in this Quranic verse, God makes himself transcendence and eminent, transcendent and eminent in the world in one verse. He says, um, God said, there is, this is the Quranic verse, there is nothing like him, says Ibn Arabi, thus making himself transcendent. And then, Quranic verse, uh, he is the all-hearing, the all-seeing, and says Ibn Arabi, thus likening himself to creation. So in one verse, both transcendence and immanence. The first part of the verse, that is, there is nothing like him, shows his transcendence. And the second part of the verse that says he is the all-hearing, all-seeing, he's uh, pointing to similarities. He's making himself imminent in the world. He sees, he hears. Um, so, thus making himself imminent. Next comes another controversial passage, uh, which has caused lots of problems. He says, considering Adam's inward-outward constitution, he is both the real and the created. Adam, and thus the perfect man, oscillates between the creator and the created. Is Ibn Arabi saying that Adam, or the human being, like as perfect man, is God? Well, no, of course not. Uh, but the human being's spirit, his soul, is divine. It is only that aspect of the human being that is divine, that is God. Um, the human being, no different in this respect from other beings, is a manifestation of the divine names and uh, of divine names and qualities. It is in this sense that the human being is divine. Human beings are more divine than other created beings like animals, like lifeless things, only and only considering his divine spirit. And it is in this sense that Ibn Arabi says the perfect man oscillates between the creator and the created. He's not claiming the humans to be gods, and that's a very big misunderstanding that some people have fallen into. So, conclusion. I have drawn two conclusions in, in this chapter of my thesis, the first one I will not tell you because I don't want to give my stance in this matter. I will not tell you that. Uh, 
I will just tell the second conclusion. Well, the second conclusion is that this doctrine, uh, when you read Sousa Lacan, um, I get to the conclusion that, yes, this doctrine is rightly named the doctrine of the unity of existence. Again, yes, Ibn Arabi himself does not use this terminology, but considering the context and uh, reading the commentaries, yeah, it is fairly named the doctrine of unity of existence or al wahdat al-wujud. So, that will be all. Uh, I have nothing more to add from the passage. This is all. I think you have, I'm hoping that you now have uh, a clear picture of what this doctrine is. And the rest is on you. How you judge it is your responsibility. I didn't give my opinion. I didn't defend it. I didn't reject this doctrine. That's your job. But my uh, recommendation is this, and this is very important. Um, before you judge anything, uh, first, don't. <laughs> Uh, what um, what I mean is this, these are very technical matters and for any technical discipline you need the technical knowledge. Let's say I want to make a judgment on neuroscience, but I'm not a neuroscientist, so how in the world would I expect myself to be, have, to, 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 to my opinion to be any, to have any credit? It doesn't, because I'm not an expert in that matter. But when it comes to these matters, everyone is an expert, they just spend one or two months reading and they reject things, they approve things. Don't do that. My recommendation for you is this, have a realistic approach. If you want to get into this field, fine, beautiful. But first, step number one, study philosophy, the fundamentals of philosophy. Know what philosophy is. And this doesn't come with one or two months of reading. This should be a long-term plan. Two, study theology, its principles, its foundations. And then, again, a long-term plan. And then put them together. Put them next to Quran. Put them next to Hadith. That is the prophetic sayings. And uh, then, then compare them. Like, they compare this doctrine. Or, you know, like, analyze, examine this doctrine in the context of this whole tradition. Does it make sense? Uh, is it in line with, with the tradition? Is it not? Well, that's for you to decide, not me. But my recommendation is spend time, uh, spend a long, long time, because these are dangerous topics. These are very sensitive topics. Don't be in rush. Don't make a judgment in one or two months. And if you are not an expert in this field, you're free not to be an expert. Like you don't have to be an expert. Uh, listen, learn, see both sides. Don't make a judgment. Uh, or at least if you make a judgment like personally to yourself, keep it to yourself. Don't go online like attacking other people. Um, I, I see many people who come to like Instagram to, to d prove or disprove a theory or a doctrine. And that is just a waste of time for both people who create those posts and for those who, who read them. These are these are not matters to be discussed with Instagram posts. Uh, the misunderstanding that most people have is this. They write a sentence and they say, wow, what a philosophy. That's not philosophy. Philosophy is not sentence oriented. Philosophy is argument oriented. In philosophy, we don't write the conclusion of a sentence or say, wow, how beautiful. That, that's not philosophy. In philosophy, we go through arguments. If you want to get to a conclusion, you cannot claim it. You cannot claim the final thing in one sentence. In order for me to accept your argument, you should give me the premises, like premise 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, 100, whatever. So you say, based on these premises, therefore, this conclusion. And then I can decide, yeah, based on these premises, this conclusion is credible or it's not. So. Uh, uh, this is also a, an important point that I wanted to, um, I wanted you to know that in philosophy we don't care about single sentences. We don't care about final conclusions. We care about the holistic thing. So that is philosophy. If you want to get into this field, uh, learn that, and uh, learn theology. Anyways, I hope this video was of help, and um, I sincerely hope that you. Uh, that you take the next step and I hope that this video um, helped you um, get closer to the real um, in the sense that uh, in Arabic we have the word 
ma'rifa, uh, some translated as knowledge, some translated as recognition, um, whatever you translate it, um, some translated as wisdom. Um, I hope you get to that wisdom, to that ma'rifa. Um, you, you get closer to it, even one inch, even, even if this widow helped you get there, like get closer, even one inch, that, that's, that's enough for me. I hope you continue this road uh, if you are interested in these subjects. And I hope these things will make you a better person with regards to the real than you were before. So thank you very much for watching the video. Assalamu alaikum and see you soon with other videos.